far as the question about the abdominal pain, you know, there, there has been a lot of pelvic pain from some of the individuals with uh, ligament laxity because of dilation of the pelvic veins, and uh, that may be somewhat of an answer for the uh, abdominal pain issues, or at least the pelvic pain issues. So this is a little bit different topic. Uh, how we got interested in this is uh, in uh, 1999, Dr. Millerette, when myself and he were over at Downstate in Brooklyn, had put together a series of about 364 patients with Chiari. And it sort of presented itself, the paper presented itself as a redefinition of Chiari. Because Chiari, in most neurology textbooks, pretty much was defined as a headache, cough headache, uh, downbeat nystagmus, and ataxia. And you virtually never see that. The, what neurologists were describing decades ago was a very severe uh, syndrome of brainstem and cerebellar compression that we're far more sensitive to and see far more a broad spectrum of patients than they initially reported on in autopsy studies that were done decades ago. But the neurology literature, as far as textbooks and the education of neurologists, lags an awful lot further behind. Speak to that issue is, I'm, you know, you've seen and heard from a lot of uh, neurosurgeons over the last day or so. Well, I'm probably the sole neurologist involved in some of this here because there's really a very uh, big gap in the education uh, in the neurology community as far as uh, understanding a lot of these syndromes. Um, what we tried to establish back then was that uh, there were really a manifest and manifold number of symptoms that Chiari patients presented with. And uh, as you see listed here with the percentages, the overwhelming majority of patients had occipital, suboccipital headache with a frequent retroorbital component and a pressure-like and exertional aggravation of those symptoms. And many of you who are affected, uh, I'm sure, can relate to that. There were frequent ocular disturbances, including a lot of nonspecific things like blurring of vision, occasional transient double vision, things like that that are hard to put your finger on. Also, some acoustic symptoms and uh, disequilibrium or vestibular kinds of complaints uh, in, a, in addition to tinnitus or ringing in the ears. And various types of tinnitus could be described, pulsatile tinnitus, high, low pitch tinnitus, various types. There was frequent uh, dysesthesias, numbness, tingling, burning in the limbs, more often than not in the upper extremities. And uh, the sum total of some of these symptoms was also, also accompanied by chronic fatigue. There were bulbar and cognitive problems, sleep apnea, tremors, palpitations, a lot of dysautonomic symptoms similar to what Dr. Uh, um, Rickade has described in the uh, EDS population. Uh, and uh, this led to our sort of understanding of the conundrum that a lot of the patients faced in sort of this blind men in the elephant scenario where you have the seven physician syndrome, like Dr. Uh, Rickade alluded to, and patients were variously identified as being migraineurs or pseudotumor patients or variant Meniere's disease, which is a episodic uh, vertigo type of syndrome, seen by ENT physicians, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, oftentimes followed by rheumatologists and other uh, physicians, endocrinologists, neurologists, and uh, rheumatologists again. A lot of these syndromes are sort of nebulous and not uh, dignified by specific diagnostic tests which make them easily identifiable. So it produced a kind of a big, big problem and many, much of the confusion in uh, management and treatment and identification of Chiari patients was really understanding uh, what the whole picture was. You have to understand that physicians learn about uh, medicine really in, in a way that's kind of unexpected to a lot of patients, I think. They're learned by gestalt, and that is you see one, you see two, you see three, you begin to know what this particular kind of thing looks like. That's how we make the distinction between a donkey and a pony and a horse. Uh, you have to know what you're looking at, and you really identify patients and you have expectations. You only see and identify what you're familiar with and what you're looking for. So doctors see what they're looking for. The educational problem is to have them identify that multiple spectrum kind of problems should be identified in certain ways, and that's where things begin to fall apart. You know, if you go into a doctor's office and you have more than four or five symptoms, 
their eyes begin to glaze over. You know you only have about five minutes left in your appointment, and uh, they want to refer you to a psychiatrist. I also deal with a lot of neuromuscular disease, and uh, we used to talk about myasthenia gravis patients, which was uh, uh, outside of Aristotle Onassis, one of the more, and uh, double, one of the 007 guys, Roger Moore, having been affected by it, was sort of an obscure diagnosis. We'd always say that you had to be seen by four neurologists and a psychiatrist before they made the diagnosis. The, uh, so this presented a kind of problem, and Dr. Millerett, and who encouraged me to get interested in this because I was sort of in another ballpark at the time. I was interested in neuromuscular disease and spinal cord disease, including uh, MS and, and spinal muscular atrophy, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and spinal cord disease. And when I first became interested in this, uh, I saw it as a great opportunity because I'd only seen one, one patient in about, at that point it was about 20 years, I only seen one patient with syringomyelia. And actually, neurosurgeons are fairly familiar. You've seen the discussion by many of the uh, neurosurgeons. But neurologists probably on average have experience with one or two syringomyelia patients in their entire uh, medical career. Uh, so it, it's, it's relatively rare, but it's kind of a, a figment of the way patients get filtered through the medical system. So when you have a structural abnormality like that, patients kind of zoom right to the neurosurgeon. They go from the orthopedic being identified with scoliosis, then to a neurological abnormality that looks surgical, and to the neurosurgeon. So neurologists sometimes get bypassed. A lot of what we do in medicine is dependent on what you how the availability of treatment. So people get very interested and are taught a lot about things that you have treatments for. Now, neurologists don't do surgical treatments, so I, you know, it was not thought of to think about them managing Chiari or managing syringomyelia for that, for that matter. And we have to get to a level of a great deal more uh, of uh, um, sophistication in managing the multiple medical and neurological symptoms a lot of these patients, uh, patients have. So, uh, we became interested in the idea of why did a Chiari surgery fail? And uh, one of the, there were a couple of questions. One, the surgery as it evolved through the 1900, you know, the late in the last century and 2000 to 2010, 2015, we're still going through this evolution of better understanding what Chiari is and how to separate it from other things and, and what kind of surgery is appropriate. Um, you heard Dr. Limerick talk about we're trying to decide what kind of surgery is better to solve the problem of syringomyelia surgically. So we're not even really as far as, as that. And there's a lot of difference in opinion from, uh, about the kinds of operations to be done. And there are many steps in the surgical procedures which make it even more complicated. So the, the problem was is that there were many patients that were falling through the cracks and had had Chiari surgery and uh, didn't really feel or doing much better. And one of the thoughts that we uh, were trying to get at is what was the explanation for this? We also thought, and uh, some of the other folks mentioned the idea about the push down, pull down, suck down, shake down, <laughs> a different kind of pathophysiologic processes, but we now understand that we look at tonsillar descent rather than some kind of just uh, mystical Chiari malformation that may be totally anatomical. So we look at methodology, of, of diagnosing conditions that may cause uh, and be responsible for tonsillar descent, and those things can be multifold. And as we approach the diagnosis of patients, we really want to be aware of those things. Because if we, put, if we do the wrong op, if we do whatever we thought might have been the right operation for the wrong indication, we're going up, barking up the wrong tree. And that was manifest by the experience with patients with EDS, for instance. Uh, early. Um, use of decompressive procedures, uh, posterior fossa decompression frequently made these patients worse. There were a group of patients at Hopkins, for instance, I think a number of years ago, with chronic fatigue syndrome. Decompression surgery was tried in those patients. Those patients invariably did, uh, did worse or had complications. So um, you have to do the right operation for the right problem. And so we gradually have evolved over the last 20, 25 years trying to pick out what's the underlying mechanisms behind this. And you've heard that explanation a little bit with uh, what I'm going to tell you about and what Dr. Rakeke talked to you about is, as far as Sarah syndrome's concerned and the identification of patients with these other mechanisms of tonsillar herniation or tonsillar descent. So why did we uh, find, and we had about 380 patients, and these were the kind of things that looked like they hadn't been solved yet. They had persisting or 
or enlarging syringomyelia. They had pseudomeningocele, and that's false pockets or leakage around at the surgical site outside of the CSF space. Chronically raised intracranial pressure, um, which is what primarily we're going to focus on. You heard a lot about the syringomyelia problems and the management of that, and uh, I'm going to sort of focus on these second two. But this amounted to about 30% of the patients that seemed to have failed results from surgery. Did we do the wrong operation, or were there ancillary problems that needed to be better understood and managed? Cranial cervical instability, you just heard an excellent exam example of that with uh, what Dr. Rickade had to talk to you about. And that was, again, a smaller percentage, but still contributed to why patients seem to have failed standard Chiari surgery. So um, this is an example of one of the first cases uh, that we had in the kind of toward the end of the 1990s. We were looking at patients, and we would see numbers of patients that had pseudomeningocele. They had membranes across here. There had been leakage at the surgical site. This is a post-op patient, and uh, she certainly had a Chiari malformation, and she certainly had a significant syrinx. And in fact, after the decompression, her syrinx was thankfully and, and, and as expected collapsed, but she had this persisting fluid collection here. So why might that have been the case? It took a while to sort of understand uh, that some of these patients actually had uh, raised intracranial pressure and uh, that the explanation for this would, would have been that the raised intracranial pressure actually forced fluid out through the surgical site and contributed to the development of this. Now you have a fluid collection back here that can act, fluid is non-compressible so this is uh, almost tantamount to a rock being placed back there. It's a, it's a source of pressure and it's a source of closure at the craniocervical junction. So these probably, if they don't resolve within six months to a year, need to be surgically treated. But is there something we can do to understand it better or prevent it? It's another example of a patient that had uh, an interesting uh, example of an expanded uh, cisterna magna and a wide uh, open fluid spaces here. But if you'll notice the duraplasty, is really patchless and expanded. And when you think about what might cause that, oftentimes uh, surgical scars shrink. And uh, we've heard about children having regrowth of bone and the like, but it's not hard to imagine, as we found out, that this patient had chronically raised intracranial pressure. And that the, the pressure effect of CSF there is actually distended progressively, trying to, trying to equalize the pressure in the, in the head. So this idea of spinal fluid flow and, and how, it, uh, how it manifests in these patients is, uh, is uh, better and better understood. So spinal fluid, as you probably know, is made in the cerebral ventricles. It comes down through the frame of Monroe, through the aqueduct of Sylvius, and wanders into the fourth ventricle right beneath the uh, cerebellum and out through some portals at the base of the cerebellum where they can, in fact, sometimes be compressed and be a component of the Chiari problem with associated hydrocephalus. In fact, Chiari, who is a pathologist in Europe, uh, first described six cases of what was called a Chiari malformation. All those patients had hydrocephalus. So <laughs> the original description of Chiari had absolutely nothing to do with what we currently understand as Chiari malformation. They were all patients with hydrocephalus. How would you appropriately treat those patients? You wouldn't knock the back of their head off you would decompress their hydrocephalus and watch the ventricles rise up and be appropriately opening the spaces at the base, uh, base of the skull. So these spaces uh, contribute, and their anatomical and physiologic function contributes to the pressure inside your head. So what is the pressure inside your head caused by? There's arterial pressure, there's venous pressure, and there's the pressure of the production and the absorption of spinal fluid, and then the mass of the brain itself, all right? The resilience of the brain. So those are like five compartments in here that all contribute to what the uh, pressure is within the head. You've heard a, a bit about how important the hydrodynamics of this area are because spinal fluid shuttles uh, through across the foramen magnum, and it spaces in the spinal cord, which physiologically abnormal as they may be, may give rise to syringomyelia. What's the circumstances for your spinal fluid in your head? You have about 450 cc's of spinal fluid in that compartment, in that, uh, that fluid compartment. And you make about 150 cc's 
a day. So you turn over your spinal fluid about three times during the day. And uh, so the fluid is produced at about a third of a cc a minute. So if you have a spinal tap and uh, you take off about 10 cc's, it takes about 30 minutes for that fluid to be replaced. Uh, now, in health and disease, the production of spinal fluid doesn't really change very much. Whether you're 80 or 8, you're going to make about the same amount of spinal fluid. Whether you're dehydrated or not, it keeps on pumping, all right? The differences that can uh, reflect a lot on what the intracranial pressure is, is the resistance to uh, absorption or the exit of spinal fluid from your head, all right, from uh, this compartment. And that's actually a passive function. It's just pushed out across the brain and into the venous, uh, into, into the venous structures. We now have some very interesting new ideas about uh, various kinds of possibly even lymphatic channels in the brain, which didn't even were not even known to exist more than a year or two ago. But suffice it to say, at this point, your venous resistance has a lot to do with what your intracranial pressure is. And this has a lot to do with what we understand about pseudotumor or idiopathic intracranial hypertension or the various names that it's been called. So to add to the confusion is we call the same thing at least three or four different names. Uh, so when you have intracranial pressure that's elevated, uh, you can have some various phenomena that primarily affect the visual function because the dura, as it extends out along the optic nerves, the optic nerves and the retina are really part of the central nervous system. So the dura actually extends along the sheath and the, along the optic nerve, and this can be filled with fluid. So sometimes it can be a sign, and I'll show you some of the radiologic features that we can now, with uh, high-resolution MRI, are more frequently uh, understood to be able to help us under, uh, figure out what, whether there's raised intracranial pressure. This is a problem sometimes in the Chiari patients, because if you have tonsillar descent and a tight posterior fossa, a lot of folks are going to have be a little bit circumspect about sticking the needle in the back and letting fluid out, because we know that suck down mechanism can reduce the pressure below the, the pressure in the, in, at the craniocervical junction and actually impact the tonsils even, even more. So a lot of folks uh, don't get spinal taps to the degree that they did years ago. When I was a resident a long time ago, we had to, on the chart, you know, you had to have the spinal fluid results. It was like you could do the urine and the CBC, and you had to have the spinal fluid results. Most residents now have only done a handful of spinal taps after three years of training in neurology. So we, it's not a procedure we oftentimes do. Um, but it's the, a very important factor in understanding uh, some of the symptoms that patients present with. Well, I showed you the early uh, ideas about how much uh, what were the symptoms of, of Chiari? Now take a look at the symptoms of uh, pseudotumor cerebri. Now here's a little abbreviation. Again, the terminology is confusing because I'm talking about increased intracranial, uh, you know, um, elevated intracranial hypertension, and then I'm talking about this PTC. This is the same thing. So it's raised intracranial pressure, and we've added another name, CRIPS, chronically raised intracranial pressure. So the terminology is unfortunately uh, confusing. But look at the, look at the symptomatology. We have headache, visual obscurations, intracranial noise, pulsatile tinnitus, retroorbital pain, double vision, visual loss, shoulder and arm pain, vertigo. Does that look a little bit like what Chiari patients have? All right. And so uh, what's the epidemiology of this syndrome? Well, we think Chiari's maybe about one in a thousand individuals. Now that varies because if you look at all the MR pictures that we do nowadays, probably maybe one in 300 have slightly low lying tonsils. And depending on how you split this arbitrary level of tonsillar descent, uh, the definition of Chiari is confusing. We're trying to make that a little better by establishing broader ranges of criteria for the diagnosis. But suffice it to say, for, for this uh, pseudotumor syndrome, it's about one in 100,000. When you look at women age 20 to 44, it's 20-fold more increased. The age of onset is 28 to 44 or so, right in the age group where, where Chiari patients present. We know also that there's a female predominance here. There's also a female predominance in Chiari. It's maybe 3 to 1 for Chiari. But in this, it gets up to 15 to 1 females to males uh, as, as uh, we progress in the age.
Before puberty, boys and girls are equally affected. After puberty, women are affected nine times more often than men. So we think that there's a hormonal factor there, or a sex difference factor that's uh, uh, important. There also is a striking uh, association with uh, body mass index or weight. Everyone knows and hears about the fact that our population is not only expanding, but it's gaining in weight. So about 30% of the population is considered to be obese. And obesity is a major factor in the development of uh, abnormalities or increases in intracranial pressure. So BMIs uh, above, above 30, 35 or 40, and you, as you increase the BMI, you increase the risk factors for this. So again, until puberty, boys and girls are equally affected by this. The prevalence of obesity in both men and women affected by PTC is equal. So men are just as fat as women, but the weight in general uh, increases the likelihood of developing intracranial pressure abnormalities. Now for a BMI greater than 35, the odds ratio for PTC is about 26 times the normal weight, normal weight individual. So if you're overweight, you have 26 times the likelihood of having elevated intracranial pressure. With whether you have this totally or not, or you have Chiari, is going to affect your intracranial pressure, and hence the pressure-like headaches that people experience. Um, the increasing prevalence of women uh, over uh, puberty is likely related to factors in addition to obesity. So that's why we th think that there's a hormonal factor. Interestingly enough, the prevalence of, ED of EDS and Chiari malformation also has this female predominance. So we're beginning to see a lot of convergence of ideas about these. Now, just for our understanding about this as it's a little bit separate in some ways from, from Chiari, there are some secondary causes of increased intracranial pressure. So what are they? Well, exposure to medications has been found to be somewhat important. Exposure to tetracycline. So if all of you have been through general evaluations in the right place, you've probably been screened for Lyme disease because persons have a lot of nonspecific symptoms. So it's not uncommon for people to be exposed not only to a few weeks, but months and months of doxycycline to treat potential neural uh, uh, Lyme disease. This is a risk factor for the development of raised intracranial pressure. We don't understand the mechanisms exactly. Uh, we used to ask as residents, have you had any polar bear liver lately? Uh, that was kind of a sound like a stupid question, but who gets uh, elevated intracranial pressure? Alaskan Eskimos that eat polar bear liver, as a matter of fact. It's very healthy for them, but it's very rich in, uh, in vitamin A. So they get hypervitaminosis A, and they develop uh, elevated intracranial pressure. Withdrawal from corticosteroids and the use of growth hormone. I don't know about where all of you live, but in New York City, if you go into some of the fashionable doctor places, that'll charge you two or $3,000 for an evaluation of whatever you have wrong with you. They're frequently liking to give people growth hormone injections. And this is kind of a little bit of more of a custom in Europe and Eastern Europe, but it's come into the United States and, and uh, uh, if you have a disease that's not so, or symptoms that are not so well understood, you tend to be subject to the trials and tribulations of getting treatments that may, be, uh, ha may in fact be hazardous in some ways. Systemic lupus erythematosus and some other medical conditions are rarely causing this, but uh, the one important one here is sleep apnea. Why would sleep apnea be effective there? We are interested in that because sleep apnea is very common in Chiari, because of brainstem compression, you just don't have to be a fat old guy like me to have sleep apnea. You can have it with young, slim girls who have respiratory involvement simply as a presenting, uh, presenting symptom of Chiari. So it's important to really identify that, particularly if individuals have sleep-related problems. They don't have restorative sleep. They have chronic fatigue, because the, one of the major causes of chronic fatigue is lack of restorative sleep. So this is a very important. How does it work for intracranial pressure? Well, a lot of people with sleep apnea are overweight. They have obstruction here. They hypoventilate. When you hypoventilate, you elevate your, your, your PCO2, your carbon dioxide level. And what does that do? It dilates all the veins in your head, and it increases intracranial pressure. When we have accident victims that come into the emergency room, the first thing we do is put a tube down their throat and we hyperventilate them. By blowing off CO2, you can shrink the brain significantly by hyperventilating the patient. And that's an acute mechanism, but on a chronic basis, 
chronically raise CO2 levels, and that particularly it's in sleep can be a problem. You get non-restorative sleep, not only do you get high CO2 levels, but you get reduced oxygen, and low oxygen is not good for your brain either, all right? So, so this is a major important thing. Now, uh, all of the major proponents of various disorders, like this Indians and the elephant problem, they have, uh, you know, really identified criteria. We've seen a lot about how uh, pseudotumor can be like Chiari, but there's some ways in that which it's, it's kind of different as well. So how do they diagnose uh, pseudotumor? Pseudotumor, interestingly enough, comes into the system, into medical contact, primarily through ophthalmologists. Why ophthalmologists? Because patients have visual problems and progressive blindness. It's a serious threat to vision. So, and I'll show you why. But, so, papilledema is a major and almost invariably associated physical finding. So much that it's the top one on their major criteria. And they routinely measure intracranial pressure, and they like to see the intracranial pressure be above 250 millimeters of water. Normal pressure is about 150 to 180 millimeters of water, and most neurosurgeons wouldn't want to think about just shunting someone unless their pressures were routinely above 250. Uh, there's some medical treatments and other issues for, for management in between there. There are some other uh, minor hurdles to kind of make the diagnosis, and frequently, the even if you can't uh, see papilledema, but maybe you have a six nerve palsy, or you have some radiographic findings that I'm going to show you, that will qualify for this. So you don't actually have to have elevated intracranial pressure even to be diagnosed with pseudotumor. So that's, again, kind of complicated. Uh, so, hmm. well, I don't know why that didn't come out. I had a nice picture of the visual, <laughs> visual appearances here. It, it somehow didn't get make, the pictures didn't make it in. But patients have some visual blurring. Uh, uh, double vision sometimes, mainly from partial six nerve uh, encroachment because pressure in the head can strain and stress the six nerve. Neurologists call this a frequent false localizing sign because it doesn't take much to give you difficulty with uh, lateral separation of your eyes. Some patients may have demonstrated what we call esotropia. When you cover and uncover them, we can see that their eyes are a little weak in abduction. Um, uh, whoop. Oh, so that, that did it. That's even nicer. I wish I'd have figured that out. All right, so blurring of vision, uh, pr preservation of some central vision, because sometimes with uh, intracranial pressure elevation coming on and causing papilledema, the lateral parts of the retinas get a little bit separated. Uh, and and uh, horizontal diplopia. One of the important things about pseudotumor is papilledema, patients complain of, uh, of pressure-like headaches. But they, uh, they actually have some visual field loss, and the visual field changes are generally uh, those of the enlargement of the blind spot. And, you, you know, we all have blind spots uh, that are the area of the retina where the optic nerve comes through. We don't, we're unaware. We just don't have vision in those areas. So the most common thing that happens is enlargement of the blind spot and uh, sort of arcuate fiber damage uh, around that. The important thing is that it's visual field testing detects that far before you have other visual field problems. So it's important for us to team up with uh, uh, our ophthalmologic friends who do not only good visual assessment of the retina, but also some other testing modalities, and to look for uh, sixth nerve palsy or, 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 or less frequently fourth nerve palsy problems, which can be relatively subtle. Um, so that's what we do as our exam. Here's what papilledema looks like. This is terrible, this is a little less terrible, but the optic nerve is actually pushed forward by the pressure of intracranial pressure into the back of the eye. And here you see a little bit uh, less and almost normal optic nerve. This is, why, this is the way the ophthalmologists evaluate the visual fields, and we can actually very clearly identify where the blind spot is with individual eye testing. These are Goldman perimeters. Um, this is what papilledema looks like, and this is what they find when they do the perimetry, enlargement of the blind spot. And sometimes there's actually a, 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 um, a, a, a central sequel or a curvature of fibers across here that begins to um, affect vision. And then there's some peripheral buckling of the retina that leads to some minor difficulties in, in, in uh, vision at the outsides of the visual field.
This is something that looks kind of like papilledema, doesn't it? But it's actually something we call optic nerve drusen. This is one thing to point out from the physician's standpoint that can, can be uh, confused with, uh, confused with uh, papilledema, because this is not papilledema. There are some other testing methodologies that the ophthalmologist can offer us, and, th and this is an OT OCT machine. That's optical coherence tomography. It's kind of like side scan sonar, the back of your eyeball. All right, so picture seeing the Titanic, you know, at the bottom of the ocean. Well, we can have a good look at your optic nerve head by, uh, this is the cup, the optic nerve puncturing through here, and uh, this is the pit where the vessels come through into the, into the center of the nerve. This is some mild papilledema. The nerve head is pushed forward. This is drusen. It looks a little bit different, and we see these irregular spikes because this is fatty material that some people have congenitally just deposited in the optic nerve. But this kind of testing can, uh, can easily separate the two. Here's what papilledema looks like. The optic nerve, instead of being uh, regularly distributed here with uh, nerve fibers uh, spreading out to, uh, to supply the retina, this becomes edematous and began to have degenerative changes through, uh, through this area. Uh, and you can see dilation of the subarachnoid space around here, which is further pressing on, and the arterial supply to the retina. So what are the um, uh, radiologic features of this? It's a funny picture. I didn't, it didn't look funny to me initially, but some people said, boy, that guy's really staring at you. Um, but the optic nerve cuffing is here. So this is, you can see here, this is if we brought the imaging forward just a little bit, we'd see the optic globes, all right? And uh, here we see the, the muscles that control the movements of the eyes. And right in this area is the optic, optic nerve. And what do we see around it? The spinal fluid is white. This is cuffing of the optic nerve. So this is easily identified on coronal views to see. And it's a, it's a clear marker for elevation and intracranial pressure. Here we see it again. Here we see some changes where we can actually see dilation of the subarachnoid space, cuffing it around. And we see. Actually, we can see that protrusion with high-resolution MRI. We can actually see the protrusion of the optic nerve. Uh, and you'd expect here that on routine ophthalmoscopy, you'd be able to see an elevated, uh, uh, some papilledema. Now, this is, uh, again, a similar kind of, uh, this doesn't come through on mine, let me see. OK, uh, the other thing marker is uh, something we call an empty cella syndrome. So uh, here is the pituitary gland, here's the pons, and you see this in increased puddling of fluid. The pituitary fossa is like, a, is like a timpani drum with a diaphragm on top of it. Pituitary rests in there. When there's pounding influence of the spinal fluid pulsations on there, it kind of dippity doos that, that, and, it, and it impacts on the pituitary. It does not very often cause problems with pituitary function, but it uh, is a marker for elevation in, in intracranial pressure. There are also some meningocele that develop uh, and uh, enlargement of uh, this Meckel's cave, which is around the fifth cranial nerve, which has an elaborate uh, vascular structure around it, frequently an explanation for numbness and tingling, peculiar sensations in the face. We see dilation around other nerves. These are the third nerves with dilation of their cuffing a dural accompaniments, and similarly here. Here is the, op uh, the, uh, the opti uh, not the optic nerve, but the third cranial nerve, which is primarily responsible for most of the ocular movements, uh, is, uh, has increased CSF around it. And uh, in the sixth cranial nerve, as it comes through and into the bony structure of the base of the skull, there's dilation of the subarachnoid space around there. And here's the hypoglossal nerve, which has, uh, again, dissected spinal fluid around these comp compartments. Another important thing which Dr. Rickate sort of made us aware of, in the last couple of years when he came from Arizona, they had understood and been focused on uh, the causes for a pseudotumor and increased intracranial pressure as related to uh, uh, venous obstruction or venous sinus thrombosis. Venous sinus thrombosis is a rare and sometimes very serious complication of the vasculature in the head and it obstructs the draining veins. Now, as we said before, your CSF pressure is related to the venous pressure. So to the extent that you have elevated venous pressure from chronic lung disease, or you have elevated venous pressure in your head because you have obstruction to those veins, 
you're going to have problems with increased intracranial pressure. That spinal fluid is not going to be able to transit out of, out of the CSF space into the venous space. Uh, these are just some caveats about you have to have an MRI, not just a phase contrast MRI, you have to have contrast. Because the phase contrast, if there's turbulent flow and, and high flow, it, it messes things up. So you have to have a CT with contrast or an MRI with enhanced contrast to make this worthwhile. And there's so many uh, false uh, positives that it causes problems. You may be aware that the whole MS story in the last, uh, last two or three years was all turned on about the fact that venous obstruction might be a cause of multiple sclerosis. And most of what they found was that this was mostly red herrings and it was just false, uh, false positive testing from inappropriately done studies. So, but this has some bearing on, on what we look at in, uh, in patients with potentially increased intracranial pressure. Here's another one where it looks like there might be an obstruction here. And when you really do a contrast enhanced study, you can see that the venous drainage in the posterior fossa here with the transverse and sigmoid sinuses is perfectly normal. So in conclusion, we have some ways, it's important to know what's important about this. We have some ways to manage an elevated intracranial pressure. We can use Diamox, which is an age-old medication that used to be used to treat uh, glaucoma. We have an alternative, Neptazane or Methazolamide, and Topamax, which is an anticonvulsant that has some secondary effects on this carbonic anhydrase enzyme that affects uh, CSF production. Weight loss is important. Chiari patients, not only our population, but patients with chronic pain don't do much. They gain weight. The average weight of our population is, is much in excess of normal just because of the weight gain problems. So this has to be controlled. You have pound for pound, every weight above normal weight increases your intracranial pressure. That's going to affect headache and uh, CSF flow dynamics. Now the problem is, is that if you give some patients nowadays a choice between brain surgery and weight loss, some people say, I'll have the brain surgery, you know. Uh, <laughs> I struggle with this problem myself. I don't think I would go to the extremity of having brain surgery, but I'm not very effective at weight loss either, so I don't know. So uh, assessment of venous flow has to be done appropriately, and uh, uh, there are some patients that still possibly remain candidates for a shunt. But Dr. Rickade, in his uh, great experience with childhood hydrocephalus, has kind of waved us off uh, doing this. There was a time when we were doing, putting in shunts to a, with a relatively minimal threshold to try to control headache symptoms. It was not a very successful strategy. Immediately post-op, it may have helped people for a year or two because they had post-op inflammation, blood in the spinal fluid causing uh, CSF problems. Uh, but it, it, many of those patients had to have their shunts pulled out, and many of them, uh, 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 they were not functioning. It's important to know we have very sophisticated shunts now, but the failure rate in shunts is about 20 to 25 percent. That's a fairly high number. So if you get a shunt put in within the first six months, there's a one in four chance it's going to fail, and it has to be replaced. Uh, you're better after six months. Some of these will stay in for 15, 20, 30 years, you know, which is the good news. Uh, um, so, uh, in, in conclusion then, how do we see the relation between Chiari and chronically raised intracranial pressure? About 30% of the posterior fossa decompressions that fail seem to be related to chronically increased intracranial pressure. We have to pay more attention to this. We have to pay more attention to weight loss. We have to pay more attention to drugs that may decrease intracranial pressure. Um, management with Diamox and other strategies for a pseudotumor there's some simple strategies. Just elevating the head of your bed will decrease intracranial pressure for uh, one third of your lifetime by elevating your head when you're asleep. Um, there was a strategy for a while doing super sinus decompressions where we took off the, the decompressions were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Seemed to have been a failed strategy. The thought was if you have increased pressure, you, you also compress the veins. If you compress the veins, the pressure goes up, and then the veins get more compressed, and the pressure goes up again, and it's a problem. Uh, so the strategy for shunting low level crypts does not seem to be a satisfactory one, and super sinus decompressions really didn't work out. So now the decompressions tend to be moderate size, and we direct our attention to other, other mechanisms. All right? Uh, we need to do a lot about better understanding chronically raised intracranial pressure, and we're well on the way to doing that. All right, thank you. If I have pap papilledema, 
and I eventually have a decompressive surgery. Yeah. Um, will my vision issues go away or are they permanent? What issues? Um, I have a really hard time going from this distance to that distance quickly. So um, you, what do you mean? You have effort-related headache? Vision issues. What kind of vision issues? So from going from my phone to you, it's very blurry. Um, I have a ton of vision issues. Well, I mean, well you know, it's very difficult to deal with specific related problems, you know, with in terms of vision and things that, uh, you know, are a little more complicated than just talking about them. Um, I mean, that may be accommodative difficulty, you know. I mean, that happens when you get to be around 40 and you need bifocals, you know. Your vision, you can't really do near and far vision very well. And, and so there are other questions. Certainly intracranial pressure can, can give you blurred vision, you know. And also, uh, that may be a problem. And that also, has possibility to be looked at if you're still having headache. The optic nerves in the back of my eye are supposed to be C-shaped and they're squiggly lines and straight lines. Will that correct itself after surgery, something like that? What, what's got squiggly lines? I'm not sure the I understand. optic nerves. Well, the optic nerves sometimes get a little tortuous, and that's associated with the distension of the subarachnoid space around them. That presupposes you've got elevated intracranial pressure. If your intracranial pressure is not terribly elevated, then, you know, then uh, it, it's not, it doesn't have bearing. The question is identifying that, and that's not always so easy. Papilledema, the interesting thing is that the pressure that, that many of the Chiari patients have is not extraordinarily high pressure. It's usually less than 250, 260, 280. The, the patients that are, are, are patients with uh, the visual problems that pseudotumor patients have, they're going blind. Their pressures are four, five, and 600, all right? So they have much higher pressures. So, that makes the Chiari patient's moderate pressure still an issue, but it's not so much of a problem because it doesn't threaten vision, but it certainly makes your life suck, all right? So, um, so, so that's, that's one of the things that we need to cope with. It, it, the manifestations are a little bit separate. When I look in the eyes of patients with Chiari, it's, it's quite unusual to see papilledema.